Uh, my name is Larry Reagan. I'm one of the directors at the Center for Online Innovation and Learning, COIL, with Penn State. And, and I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for those who are joining us face to face. And also, thank you for those who are joining us at a distance. It's always great to have you with us. Just by way, a little bit of protocol of how the program generally operates. And I know we're going to have another group of folks coming in because they were at another program, but they'll be joining us in a little while. So there may be a little disruption there. But um, as we go through the program, if you have questions, you might want to jot them down, make a note. And after our guest provides the, uh, uh, her talk, then we will uh, we'll open it up and have dialogue. For those of you who are online, uh, you can actually get started with your questions now. Uh, we've got uh, Brad Stenick, who's going to be on our uh, system uh, interacting with you. He can save those up and ask them to you at a, or ask them to us at a good time. So uh, nice to have you with us. So today, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Melanie Ho. She is with uh, EAB's uh, education division, if you will, research division. And um, how do you also do medical? Uh, we work with hospitals and health systems as well. You as well do that? I, I do not, no. Oh, okay. She does. You're, you're primarily <laughs> oh, yeah. in the education field. Exactly. Okay. Uh, today she's going to talk to us about the Vantage, uh, EAB's advantage on evolving higher education landscape. And um, just by way of a, a bit of a background on EAB and Penn State, this research uh, firm, which is located in Washington, D.C., has over a thousand uh, participating uh, institutions of various sources and sizes, and they conduct a, a wide range of, of research projects based on uh, pressing topics. So they, they uh, survey their communities, uh, whether it's deans or, or faculty, they find out what are the pressing issues you have, what kind of research questions might you have. This is the group then that goes out and conducts that research and then brings that back and shares it with the community, which is what the topic being EAB's Vantage means from their lens, how do they see what's happening in higher education. So I'm sure it's going to be a very uh, interesting, compelling talk. Uh, so, so with that, let me welcome to Penn State Melanie Ho. Melanie's been here, I think we figured out once or twice before. I think three times. Oh, I three times. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're practically a Penn Stater then. <laughs> I, I think we give you a certificate or something. Um, that's always followed by a request for alumni dollars then. As right, well. so right. We can right. talk later, Melanie. So uh, thank you today uh, to Melanie and her colleague, Katie, uh, for joining us here at Penn State. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Melanie. Great. Thank you. Thank you. The title of this talk, again, is EAD's Vantage Point on the Evolving Higher Education Landscape. And I wanted to begin with a little bit of context as to how we got to that vantage point. Uh, every year, I actually counted this the other day, our research team does about 5,000 interviews with college and university leaders across North America. What's been most interesting to me about this, and you can see on the right side of the slide, the range of different research memberships we have where we're having these 5,000 conversations, is how our discussions have shifted over the past nine years, almost 10 years. EAB started in 2007. When we began, in 2007, 2008, we had a few memberships. We had one for provosts, VPs of finance and administration, and heads of student affairs. And I remember very clearly that the conversations we had with each of those three different constituent groups sounded completely different. We were talking to provosts then about multidisciplinary research centers, about faculty diversity. We were talking to heads of student affairs about mental health and becoming a more data-driven organization related to student affairs assessment. And we were talking to chief business officers about shared services, how do we increase efficiency in IT and procurement and finance, and also about energy costs. Now, these were all very interesting topics. They were all relevant to probably anybody within higher education is touched by them in some way, even if they don't quite know it. But in many ways, they had very little to do with one another. If you fast forward to the last year, when I think about those 5,000 conversations we have across higher education, across so many different constituency groups, across different Carnegie classifications and regions, what's striking is how much they all have in common, which is this sense across the institution that we are at a crossroads moment in higher education where business as usual will no longer suffice. And because of that, we have to bridge silos in a different way. We have to all come together to innovate, to think about new solutions. With that, in 
sorry, topics for this afternoon. I haven't changed the slide since the last time I gave it. Uh, two things. First, I wanted to go over some of the major fundamental challenges we're hearing facing higher education across the country. And then second, we'll be looking at some of the new, I call them market and business disciplines, even though those are words that sometimes feel like dirty words to use in higher education. Because in many ways, that's what we're hearing from the colleges and universities with whom we work. We have to think about things as a market, as a business, in ways that we haven't before. So let me start with the five challenges. Uh, fact number one, maintaining excellence is expensive. I won't go over every single data point on this slide. This is just a sampling from some of our conversations. When we talk to our members and ask them, what's keeping you awake at night? What they say is, the amount we have to spend just to sustain our current level of excellence, that's not about improving, that's not about growing, that's just about keeping up with technology, with building needs, with new programs to meet the workforce. The costs keep rising and rising. How are we going to meet our ambitions? Fact number two, we have all of those increased costs. We are also more reliant on tuition dollars than we had in the past. On the left side of the slide, you can see that tuition revenues basically have been the only main source of revenue growth for institutions. Non-tuition revenues, the top gray line there, have been stagnant since 2006. What's happened to those other revenue sources, you can see on the right side of the slide. We've seen declines in state and local appropriations over the last few years. We've also seen declines in federal research funding. So things are more expensive. We have fewer sources for money. Fact number three, traditional demographics have been slowing. In this chart, we look at high school growth and demographic, demographic declines there. I won't go into detail here because I think what's difficult about this slide is also connected to the next one. Not only are there fewer high school students in the traditional age to enroll in our colleges and universities, but they have less money than they did in the past. This slide is essentially about increasingly fragile family finances. After the Great Recession, there was a lot of talk about recovery and how Wall Street recovered. Now, Wall Street may have recovered. Main Street, in many ways, did not. You can see that on the left side of the slide, number of different articles that have come out in the last few years on the diminishing middle class. That's not just about incomes. That's also about savings. Middle of the slide, there are some Worrying statistics here, 39% has been the median fall of family net worth between 2007 and 2010. Only one in three families are saving income not expended at the year's end. How are they going to pay for college? The right side of the slide, these are some of the heartbreaking conversations we hear from VPs of enrollment management and their admissions directors daily. And what they've said to us was, it's not that we didn't hear comments like this in the past. It's that we didn't hear them as frequently, as often, and with the energy and, uh, let's say, panic we are hearing from parents today. Your school is great, but I can't afford it. We're here because I haven't told my child that we had to spend all our savings a few years ago. If we pay for our daughter's college now, how will we be able to afford our son's college a few years from now? Again, these conversations are heartbreaking, but they're things that admissions directors, VPs of enrollments are hearing and enrollment management are hearing every day. Added to that is the increased level of competition that has resulted from schools trying to figure out how to deal with the forces we've talked about, the increased cost, the decline in high school graduates and family finances. On the left side of the slide, a lot of it is about institutions finding that their competitive set is different than it used to be. You used to be able to predict uh, who are the other 10 schools that your prospects whether for working adult online programs or for traditional full-time freshman seats. Where else were students applying? You usually knew. It, it was a, a clear list. Now, that is very much no longer the case. This is just an example, the University of Dayton and the Ohio State University. In the past, you probably never would have thought about these two very different institutions as competitors. But what you can see highlighted in their marketing materials student-faculty ratio, percentage of small classes. The Ohio State University is very effectively showing how many of the benefits you could get at a smaller liberal arts college you could get at the Ohio State University as well. What we heard from some faculty members at the University of Dayton is that they toured the Ohio State University. They went there, came back, raving to their institution about the small classes, the experiential education, everything they saw there that used to be Dayton's 
clear, differentiated value proposition. I uh, once also talked to a member who said it was really interesting. He was driving home one day, heard on the radio an advertisement for a program. It was flexible. It was an adult program. It was online. He said, I thought it was for my institution. And then I realized at the end of the ad it was for a competitor. But even worse than that, it wasn't somebody I even thought was a competitor to begin with. The right side of the slide, as I mentioned, students are simply expanding their consideration set. The number of the percentage of students who are applying to at least five institutions, 2012 it was 50 percent compared to 26 percent in 1990. Uh, fact number five, competition has become so pressing that I actually made two slides on it. This one on the left side of the slide, supply, is it beginning to outpace demand in a lot of these so-called new revenue areas? Every single college or university we speak with when we ask them, what is your new strategy now that you're facing these increased financial pressures? And their answer is, we're going to differentiate ourselves by starting master's programs. You can see on the left side of the slide the challenges we've already started to face here. That while conferrals of master's programs are certainly going up, there is increased demand. The number of online programs being launched probably doing so at a pace that is outdoing the amount of supply. On the right side of the slide, I think the challenge here is that the newer fields are also crowded too. On the left side of the slide, I looked at some of the main professional master's programs, MPAs for example. The right side of the slide will often have members say, hey, we're trying to get into a, a more niche field. How about health administration? Right side of the slide, we did a quick survey of health administration programs at the very point that many members said that this was what they were hoping could be a new and differentiated area. Inside the magnifying glass, you can see the programs just in Houston. So again, fact number one, maintaining excellence is expensive. We've got a lot we need to pay for in terms of strategic ambitions, sustaining excellence. Fact number two, we are more reliant on tuition dollars than we had in, been in the past due to the decline in other funding sources. Fact number three, that's even harder because our traditional demographics where we would get that tuition money uh, has been slowing. Fact number four, even harder due to increasing family finances, and fact number five, all of this has led to greater competition between institutions, concerns then about how you'll be able to sustain your market share and grow enrollments. What that has led to is on the right side of the slide, and we see this again across the country, across Carnegie classifications, and interest across silos within any given higher education institution. And that's this need to start thinking about words like market, words like business that many institutions have been resistant to focus on in the past. I'm here going to give a quick tour of five, or four here, of the new urgent market and business disciplines that we're hearing as most prominent across the country. I'll go over each one very quickly. Uh, after this, would love to hear any of your questions. And we've got a wealth of resources behind each of these that I or someone on my team would be happy to speak with you at a later date. But let me begin with discipline number one, which is bringing new rigor to academic portfolio planning. And let me tell a little bit of a story here in terms of some of the visits that I often find myself doing at campuses across the country. They're often to dean's councils. We'll have deans across any number of colleges and schools. And usually at the request of the provost or one of the deans who will say to us, come talk to my deans about innovation. Now, it's a, it's a rather wide charge, but what has been fascinating to me is how that conversation has played out over the years. Again, what's different between when we first started having these conversations in 2011, first started meeting with the Dean's Councils, compared to now in 2017? The left side of the slide represents the conversations in 2011. First of all, opportunities were abound when it came to thinking about program innovation. We had a wide range of opportunities still left in professional master's programs. Uh, there was also high post-recessionary countercyclical demand in terms of students. It was also, though, I would say, thought by the campus as a bit of a side endeavor. First of all, the conversations at these dean's councils were focused on thinking about professional 
graduate programs where it would be a little bit easier to think about market demand, where the change management challenge wasn't quite so intense, rather than looking at core undergraduate courses and programs. And paired with that, the conversation was usually meant to inspire a few people in the room. But the sense often from the provost, from the deans that invited us, would be, you know, it's OK if we're just relying on a small number of entrepreneurial faculty, starting a small number of programs. That will be enough for now. Fast forward to what we were hearing at the end of 2016, uh, still carrying now into 2017. And these Dean's Council meetings take a very different form. On the top right there, first of all, there's a much more competitive landscape and more skeptical students. And below that, program growth and innovation have become a campus-wide imperative. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the slides to come. But essentially, first, what this means is that portfolio optimization is spanning both undergraduate and graduate. We can't just focus on new revenue-generating graduate programs at the expense of thinking about where our undergraduate courses and programs need to change. And second, there is a sense we need to get beyond the early adopters, have a bit of a larger change to faculty culture. This doesn't mean every single faculty member needs to be on board, but it does mean that we need to have much larger participation than in the past. What does that mean more concretely when we think about increased competition for programs? It means that the questions that universities have to ask when they're trying to figure out how to execute on a new program have greatly expanded over the last five years. In 2011, <coughs> when members came to us, they would generally ask us two questions. One, is there labor market demand in my region? And two, what do we need to know about accreditors? In a large market without as much competition, that was enough. In 2016, I won't read every single one, <coughs> but you can see here a much larger set of questions, ranging from what's the right format to not just what's our primary market, but what's also our secondary and our tertiary market. What are the right pathways to connect these programs to others? Are we thinking about how a certificate per stacks into a master's program, for example, or a master's program? might lead into a doctorate? How do we find the right employer partners? What marketing strategies do we need? The list goes on and on. This is just a representative sample. But essentially, the bar for creating new programs has risen substantially due to the competition, and also due to, on the right side of the slide, some other changing market factors. For example, the growth in the certificate market compared to master's programs. Or as uh, you can see here, 40% of all student borrowing coming from graduate programs and the intense pressure there to ensure that our master's programs have good outcomes. What this means on the bottom slide also is that different kinds of programs are requiring a lot more intensive planning. What we're seeing from a lot of institutions is we can't just go for smaller programs now. In the past, we were OK if we started a new master's program that maybe helped cross-subsidize a few PhD students. Now that's not enough. We have to start much larger programs. That means a much higher bar for how we plan for them. What that all amounts to is that there is no room for error this time around. I also speak with a lot of VPs of finance and administration. And their concern is that the last few years have been marked by what one member called to us profitless growth. Essentially, we're launching a lot of new programs, but are we seeing on the return. Uh, common stories here. First, too many failed programs in the past due to a lack of demand validation. Strong enrollments, even when we have them, not necessarily equating with net revenue if the costs are too high to launch, and often three years just to break even when we're lucky. The bottom of the slide, we're also hearing from many of our members that systems are raising their approval bar, or they're expected to in the future, trying to figure out, hey, did this college or university validate demand? Is there any duplication we should worry about? How much scale can we expect? And are these programs aligned with the workforce? There are also change management complexities when it comes to new academic program launches that we also didn't see to this extent five years ago. One is that at the beginning, it was sometimes easier to launch programs that weren't as interdisciplinary. You didn't have to bring as many different players involved. Many of both the opportunities left, but also probably the most promising opportunities to meet workforce needs, are actually interdisciplinary. And that has with it a higher change management challenge. 
Same with multi-institutional collaboration, something that we're hearing more and more of our members are interested in. Great ideas, so much promise, hard to execute, especially when you need to execute quickly. Next, we're finding a lot of opportunity analysis happening across the portfolio. So not just looking and figuring out what are the blue sky new programs we should launch, but hey, in addition to that, shouldn't we be looking at our existing portfolio and trying to figure out what we can grow there, where we should invest more and less? The left side of the slide is a illustrative graph of what we're finding more and more institutions starting to do, which is essentially looking at their current enrollments and figuring out where do we have room to grow, where do we need to expand, what do we need to restructure for it to work better, and what does this all mean from a curriculum standpoint, from a market research standpoint, where do we need more information about the workforce and needs and student interests, and also from a marketing standpoint. Are there ways that we can even tweak a program with a different title and help grow our enrollments? The right side of the slide, I mentioned this earlier, but we are seeing more interest, again, not just in looking at program innovation, revision, and launches at the graduate level, but at the undergraduate level as well. First point here is repositioning struggling majors to recalibrate the portfolio. This is an illustrative graph from a VP of enrollment management at a, a large public university who said, at any given time, I think one third of my majors are over-enrolled. One third are at capacity, one third are just right. So what do we do about those underrolled majors? We believe as an institution that many of these are critical to have. We certainly don't want to get rid of, say, English or geography. But what can we do to help students realize the quote unquote market value of those programs? Help them understand how an English major can help them get jobs, for example, in publishing or business or things beyond getting a PhD in English. Geography, for example, many students come into college thinking of geography as memorizing names of rivers, not realize what an exciting field it is, how many applications there are for things like GIS. Second, identifying new majors to increase applicants and yield for target students. Now, I think many students probably don't pick their colleges or universities based on major. Uh, many students will change their majors a number of times once they get there. But for a lot of our members, they're saying there are particular populations out of state, international, or particular professional majors where it makes sense to look at them at the undergraduate level. And finally, an area where I'm really excited when it comes to elevating the rigor of how we think about academic program growth and innovation is moving from this idea of one-off programs, one-off initiatives within our institutions, and thinking a more about, broadly about grand challenges. What are the big, thorny societal issues that universities want to help address? And how do they bring together faculty across the university to do so? You can see a few different examples here. And what's been probably most striking to me is how we see it across different silos within the institution, undergraduate education, advancement, research enterprise, all really circling around this idea of grand challenges. On the left side of the slide for undergraduate education, you can see an example here from the University of Montana. They've just started this initiative in the last year of a global leadership initiative really focusing on major global themes. This isn't a capstone. This isn't at the end of the student's career. This is really something that builds upon what they do across four years both inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. Now, how does this connect to other areas of the institution as well? In the middle of the slide, you can see something we're talking to a lot of our advancement members about. What they're finding is that donors are most interested today in giving their large-scale gifts to initiatives that are transformational, that are multidisciplinary, that are solving big problems. Same thing on the research enterprise. Many of our members worried about federal funding are saying we're needing to figure out how they get more funding both from federal agencies but also from corporations. Much like our individual donors in the middle of the slide, corporations and agencies are looking to give not to individual disciplines but to major grand challenges. So how do we organize around these big ideas, whether it's for teaching or whether it's for community outreach or corporate funding? I'll add here that a lot of this interest in how the university can meet the needs of the society around it, meet our economic development challenges, 
has led to a number of economic development partnerships we've seen across higher education, both two-year schools and four years. I won't read this slide in its entirety, but I'll say that what's been most interesting to me here is the business community getting involved. You can see that on the left side of the slide. We have an example of a major financial services firm, for example, that provided a huge grant to a large community college in order to ensure that they were thinking about workforce needs. The bottom left slide, this is from one of our members, where four universities were actually getting together with the local business community. Again, the business community saying, we want our city to be a hub. And in order for us to be a hub, we need to partner with institutions, making sure that they're providing all the right programs, and actually also not being duplicative in how they do so. So that is our first discipline, bringing new rigor to academic program and portfolio planning. The second discipline is integrating academic and career outcomes. Now, this has always been an issue. Universities have always thought about career service as, as an important service on their campus. But what has changed recently is the intensity at which we find the public questioning the worth of college. On the left side of the slide, we have, of course, uh, the fact that in the wake of the Great Recession, in the aftermath of the Great Recession, was when student debt crossed the trillion dollar mark. That happened around the same time that on the right side of the slide, we often found that higher education too often lacks the job outcomes to show for it. And that is marked in both underemployment and unemployment. The bottom of the slide, you can see the increase in student loan debt, how that has grown from 2004 to 2014. And in the bottom right side of the slide, 31 percentage of millennials in a Wells Fargo survey said they would have been better off working than going to college. Now, it's data like this that is leading legislatures and governors and donors and the media to essentially say to higher education, what are you doing when it comes to career outcomes? And in ways that the traditional way we've approached career services is no longer enough. I won't go over this in detail, but you can see here just a number of states who have been putting pressure on higher education. Uh, it is still unknown. We are tracking on our members' behalf whether the new administration will bring further changes at a federal level as well. We're also finding a new kind of ranking really emerging. This is just a, a small timeline. I'm sure in the next year we will probably see more of these of different websites and publications that are ranking schools explicitly by things like career outcomes. And I think what's often most pernicious, ranking schools by salary right out of college, as if that were the ultimate measure and the correct measure of ROI. This has led a lot of institutions to really think about how they are marketing differently. Here's an example from American University where you can look by degree level, by major, and get a sense of outcomes, salaries, internships, and also what kinds of jobs people landed in. Now, what I like about this map, and I think I'm finding more institutions doing in interesting ways, is it helps students understand what a history major can help them do, and understand that it, there is a higher variety of jobs than they might think. We're finding a number of institutions who are creating pretty elaborate major maps. I can uh, direct all of you to some interesting ones, for example, from Queen's University. These are large documents that help a student really see for any given major, one, what's the range of career options I could consider, so that if their parent says to them, well, what are you going to do with that philosophy major, they can actually answer in an informed way. Second, what I really like about American universities website here is it also shows salary ranges. A lot of the media rankings that we saw here and tend to give averages, which is not as helpful as ones that show that there actually is a wide range. So a history major could be making any number of different salaries after they graduate. Our third discipline that we found our members focusing on in increased ways is applying out-of-sector lessons in what I'll co call quote unquote consumer intelligence to higher education. I'm going to give a quick tour here. This is actually an area where we've done a lot of research. And I will focus on a few different areas. One, recruiting and marketing. Uh, second, advancement. And three, student success. 
in all three areas, we're seeing a lot of the common lessons in terms of thinking about, well, how do consumers make decisions? How do we capture their attention? And how can that help higher education with its recruiting and its retention goals? Those of you who are at Katie's presentation would have already seen this slide. But one of the things that's been fascinating to us is how higher education has had to adapt to changes when it comes to how, how consumers Con sorry. how consumers are able to absorb different marketing and media messages and how that has changed over the years. If you think about the beginning of advertising, all advertisers really needed to do was capture eyeballs was the word they were looking for. And that's the Don Draper era of do you have the most compelling message and are you getting in front of as many people as possible. Now we are absolutely inundated with these messages Consumers are really looking for something different when they're evaluating different products. And this is true whether they're evaluating a car or whether they're evaluating where to go to school. Unfortunately, there are some similarities in terms of how people just pay attention. First, demand is outpacing supply of consumer attention. Second, we find that consumers are accessible, but they're distracted. They have not only five different tabs probably open on their internet browser at the same time, but they're likely also on their iPad, on their phone, all at the same time. And three, consumers are simply more skeptical than they used to be about messages because, again, there are so many. We have a much more distracted audience than we used to have. And this is something that we found not only for students who have the attention of a goldfish, nine seconds. I'm not going to count how many times you've stopped paying attention to me since I started talking. But all of this means that we have to work harder and harder. We have to work harder when it comes to recruiting students due to how flooded they are with messages today. We also have to work harder when it comes to our donors. All of this has led higher education to realize that we have to look at some of the strategies that have been used in other sectors to think about marketing to students. In the past, higher education didn't really want to think of itself as marketing. I have to admit, I feel even uncomfortable sometimes using words like consumer or marketing when we are talking about students. Uh, we're not selling to them in the same way. We're here to invest in their growth and their development and their learning. And yet at the same time, not thinking about them as consumers has been a disservice for higher education in terms of ensuring that they are getting their message to as many students as they want to get to. Let me give an example from what we've been working on with our members in healthcare. So I mentioned the advisory board also has a membership of hospital and health system cabinet members. And we were hearing from many of our chief marketing officers this question of, you know, we've invested in world-class physicians for pick a discipline, say uh, knee replacement. How do we get more patients? This is a hard thing to do because your physicians are the ones who have the expertise. Marketing folks are the ones who know how to market. And yet, there's often a disconnect. The physicians want to put billboards up on their way home from work. The marketers are saying, well, we don't know if that's where our target audience is. So how do we find more patients? The physicians might say, we don't need more patients. My schedule is pretty busy as it is. The marketer will say, well, there are other physicians, and we could grow that department if we had the demand. This is something that the advisory board is actually piloting uh, with institutions in healthcare and increasingly a few in higher education. Our members on the hospital side will give us their patient data, names, zip code. That's all we really need. Then we will match those to national consumer databases. Think of this as the big, scary credit card data. It's a bit creepy, right? All we needed was your name and zip code. And now we know all of this other information about you. We know what magazines you subscribe and if you own a rent or home and how many children you have and if you use social media. What that has allowed our teams to do as we work with our hospital members is develop what's called a propensity model. That has two parts to it. The first is for your known population of patients. So this is those that you think of when you think about knee replacement surgery. Often this is, say, uh, men in their 50s who have been quite athletic throughout their lives. In this case, a hospital will say, OK, I know who these patients are. I don't know how to find them. 
what we can do then is use the big creepy data to give them a list there. But probably what's even more interesting is the idea of untapped segments. And here what we were finding was hospitals often didn't realize a particular segment that they actually could have tapped if they realized how promising it was. Here it was women who were a little bit younger, maybe in their 40s, great candidates for knee replacement, but often didn't sign up for this elective surgery because they couldn't envision how they would stop their lives to be able to do so. Not only a segment that hospitals were kind of underestimating in terms of its potential and the need here, but one where their traditional marketing materials weren't quite working. What they needed here wasn't the picture of the world-class physician, but the picture perhaps of the mother with her children and maybe a message around take care of yourself so that you can take care of them. Again, this is something that we at EAB have been doing with healthcare members for quite some time. More recently have found our higher education members saying, you know what, that's something that healthcare has started to do, that other industries have started to do, we need to do in higher education as well. That's on the marketing and recruiting side. When it comes to advancement, to thinking about how to increase our donor base, we are similarly hearing this question of how do we have to think about marketing differently than we have before. The left side of the slide, you can see that young alumni are overtaking older alumni. And that, that means that development shops have had to think about millennial preferences and attitudes towards giving in different ways. 70% of millennials plan to give online versus through mail and over the phone. They are also passionate about social issues that they care most about, which means that the pitch often has to be different, not attached to the university writ large, but particular issues that higher education is helping advance or issues on campus the student is most passionate about. And there's a desire for control and outcomes. 46% of millennials feeling like their donations would go to a black hole, wanting to get a sense of, well, what are the outcomes, wanting that follow-up that they will get often from other philanthropic causes to which they give. Every nonprofit in the country, universities, whatever, will be reliant on millennials within five to six years. That can't be dismissed. They need to be understood. That's why what we're seeing in terms of marketing and recruiting, how do we use big data, how do we capture attention in different ways, we're also seeing when it comes to thinking in terms of our donors. So we've looked at how changes in marketing and recruiting and how to capture quote unquote consumer attention have impacted us when it comes to prospective students, when it comes to donors. What about when it comes to retaining our students? I think the interesting out of sector lessons here come from behavioral economics. The idea of choice architecture or probably the most popularized expression of that is the idea of the quote unquote nudge. On the left side of the slide you can see how that works in the world. Uh, framing for example. Folks will usually pick medium as the most popular coffee size, no matter what the size of the cup is. You're just looking for the thing in the middle. What does that mean in higher education? Well, students will often take whatever is defined as a full load, if it's 12 credits, assuming they're on track. So even by institutions just changing the definition of full load, just like companies changing the size of a coffee cup, you can influence behavior. Second. People will often just pick the default option. So retirement plan enrollment, for example, changes after it's opt-in, is changed to opt-out. How does that impact us in terms of student success? Well, students will often only register for one term at a time, and they'll stick to the minimum course requirements. If you change the course requirements, or if you move towards what many institutions have in terms of multi-term registration, forcing students to register for multiple at once, you can drastically change student behavior there. Third convenience, consumers are more likely to purchase food within easy eye level, for example. Uh, there are a lot of folks in grocery stores, for example, who probably get paid a lot just trying to figure out what gets placed on different shelves. Same thing here, students often pick courses from a huge catalog based on flawed criteria. Uh, time of day, for example, of the class, not necessarily graduation requirements. So how do you ensure that they are seeing the eye level thing that's what you want them to enroll in? 
And then finally, burdening bad choice. Motorcyclists, for example, having to pass an extra test and prove that they have insurance if they're going to do something like forego a helmet. What can we do in order to ensure that students, when they withdraw from courses or drop out or deviate from plans, there's an extra transition that makes it harder? Actually, Penn State is an institution that's been very strong at this um, and that we often talk about with our members as a school that's doing that well. So I've looked now at three different parts within the institution, enrollment, advancement, and success and retention that benefit from thinking about these private sector disciplines in terms of consumers. But what about the fact that all three of those things connect to one another? So one of the things that higher education absolutely needs to get better at compared to what we see in the private sector is how we connect data across the student life cycle. In a company, uh, many different industries out there, there is this common sense about thinking about the lifetime customer. Toys R Us, for example, one of our dean members said to us, you know, Toys R Us, it is uncanny. They know when my child has turned five and when they have turned 10 and when they have turned 12 and exactly what the right toy is to market to them because they are really thinking about this as a lifetime relationship and what we need to do with them at every single phase in their life. Higher education, though, historically, has seen the different stages of the funnel as totally disconnected. Not only are these different offices, but they have different data tracking systems, probably different data definitions, and different software systems. If you wanted to connect this data at most institutions, it is incredibly hard to do so. What we are hearing, especially when we talk to CIOs, is that they are realizing as they talk to their fellow cabinet members across the campus, that this can no longer be the case. We have to move to a world where we can bring data about students together. Why? First of all, schools are able to differentiate based on the student experience in their marketing communication. So being able to track retention and success when we're talking about marketing, when we're marketing to different segments is critical. Career outcomes for example, are relevant to recruitment, student success, and advancement. But that's harder to do when all of these data systems don't talk to each other. And this is all especially important, we would say, when it comes to the world of continuing online professional education, serving adult students, where the career value proposition is extremely critical, where serving stopouts and lifelong learners is even more important because we're constantly marketing for re-enrollment as students come back for their next educational option. Finally, we'll look at ensuring access and affordability. I showed this slide before, but I wanted to begin with it again because I think it really frames how critical the access and affordability challenge is within higher education. This is an area where EAB is doing a lot more research this year. We'll be focusing many of our studies on pricing and financial aid and how institutions need to think about changes here given the decline of middle class savings and incomes. I also wanted to take a few slides to set up the access challenge that many of our institutions are facing. First of all, on the left side of the slide, you can see the projected net growth in high school graduates by race and how that has changed over the years, focusing now mainly on growth for Hispanic students. And on the right side of the slide, some of the risk factors here when it comes to both enrollment as well as student success. I'm going to double click on the challenge of first generation students on the next slide. You can see on the left side of the slide some of the challenges here. And some of the realities, 30% of entering first year students in the US are first generation college students, a number that has grown and is expected to do so more and more. 25% leave after their first year. This is a dropout rate that is four times higher than their peers. You can see on the right side of the slide some of the obstacles here, whether academic, cultural, social, or financial. This is an area where we'll be doing a lot more research over the coming months. Thinking not only about retention, but also about the access challenge. How can institutions recruit students of color in ways that are different from what they have done in the past? Again, I won't go over this slide in depth. This is an area where EAB is doing a lot more research, thinking about a few different factors. One, in terms of recruiting, how do students 
ensure that when they're looking at a particular institution, it is one where they will feel that they will succeed. And second, how can higher education form partnerships with K-12 organizations, with community colleges, with companies, in order to grow the pipeline as a whole? I also want to note that engaging students of color also connects to engaging our alumni of color. And that for many of our alumni relations and development offices, they say alumni are key, not just in terms of getting donations, though we will need to do that, but also in terms of ensuring that we have the time and the talent of our diverse alumni here to help recruit future students and to help with university service and outreach more broadly. You can see on the left side of the slide some of the challenges we've seen when it comes to just development. Uh, one of our members said it seems like we're fundraising like it's 1990. The donor pool of today demographically breaks down to what our student pool looked like in 1990 rather than our student pool today, and certainly our student pool of the future. So again, I wanted to open up for questions, but wanted to summarize here our drivers of change. Maintaining excellence ex is expensive, but we've got fewer funding sources and more competition. And on the right side of the slide, again, the market and business disciplines that we've seen institutions really needing to adopt as a result. I know I went quickly through a lot of material and probably only scratched the surface on some big and thorny issues. So I'd uh, love to open it up for questions now and elaborate on anything that's of most interest to the group. Hi there, Melanie. Uh, my name is Darren Kudray with the EdTech Network. Just curious to get your comments at looking at the drivers of change, and maybe this relates primarily to number five competition, but how is technology factor into drivers of change? And I'm thinking specifically, you know, the, the web has impacted almost every business model. It seems like it, the impact has come a little late to higher ed, but and then we also have other technology enablers like AI and others. Curious just to get your thoughts on the impact of technology as a driver. Yeah, I would say that um, I think what's been most productive is when institutions have thought about what particular objectives they have and then linked the specific technology charge to it. The thing right now, there's been a little bit of skepticism and backlash against technology. And it's largely because there was a moment, I'll say, um, you know, maybe 20 years ago, when technology felt like it was going to be the solution to everything in higher education. And there was this mad rush towards technology for technology's sake, instead of really thinking through, OK, what is our ambition here? Uh, we saw that probably first in the early 2000s. A lot of institutions just thinking, maybe technology will be our magic bullet, spending uh, a lot of money on online courses and programs, and not necessarily seeing the results because I think the focus was more on the technology, the bright and shiny object syndrome, rather than the learning, for example. Then there was a period where I think that stilled a bit. In um, 2008, as we saw both the worry about the recession and the implications after that, and then a few years later, we saw the emergence of MOOCs, I think there was a similar moment where a lot of boards we're going to higher education administrators, going to presidents and provosts, and saying we need an online strategy, and the strategy not necessarily having end objectives. So I think I probably have some concern now that there is a, a little bit of a bad taste or initiative feed fatigue at many colleges and universities because technology was thought in the, about in this very unfocused way. Whereas my hope is that colleges and universities are starting to be more focused. Technology for student success. Technology for growing the number of students we can reach through a particular online program, technology to reduce IT costs rather than this broad sense of technology. Do you mind if I follow up on that? Um, because the first, when I was listening to your drivers of change, the one thing I didn't see up there, there's probably a good reason for it, are student expectations. And I'm wondering if we can link Darren's question to the point of student expectations. What as students are coming in to our uh, institutions now, do we have any sense of their uh, their expectations for 
their experience, uh, the engagement, the access, the, the technology that's going to be used. And, and is that not a driver of change, or does that not rise up to the level of a, one of the other five? That's a very good question. I would say I probably didn't have it rise to the level of the five, because while it's required a lot of investments, it hasn't necessarily yet required a complete change to the business model or been something where schools are intensely competing based on it. So I think that probably when it comes to certain kinds of technology facilities or capabilities on the campus, there's a baseline level now that students expect. And if you don't have it, then you're in trouble. But in terms of schools competing, for example, on sometimes I wonder, will schools ever compete on their learning management system? According to learning management system vendors, they will. Um, I, I don't know that I think that's true yet. Now, could it be true in the future, right? We have students now who are, or an incoming group of students who will be more tech savvy than ever, ever before. I think about my four-year-old nephews and how adept they are on the iPad. And that they see, they will see learning in different ways than even 18-year-olds today. So um, this is a little bit circuitous, but I think about it in terms of other technologies throughout history and how they've changed education. When, when, the, when TV, for example, came, there was a radio, both of those new technologies, there actually was a lot of panic historically at those moments in time. Will students think and learn differently? And I would say that the difference then was how students or people learned informally was often still through books and still through lectures and still through more quote unquote traditional forms. So when students thought about learning, if it was largely through those other forms, then that doesn't mean that because TV or radio were available, they would expect that in every single way they consumed information. I think what we could see in terms of a change in student behavior moving forward is if gamification, for example, becomes so prevalent in K-12 and so prevalent in how they're always learning throughout their informal life that then it completely changes their expectations for higher education. So before I hand it off to Chris, I know he's got just a quick follow-up on that. So what I hear you saying, I, I think it's really a great observation, is that um, the technology infrastructure at an institution has to reach some base level. And right now, we don't think that students are probably making much of a decision about where to go other than it's got to reach that base level. But much beyond that, I, I may, that, that may not be a criteria. What I'm wondering about is, do you think the same holds true for then how much technology or, yeah, I'd say how much pedagogy and how much technology is being used within the classroom experience? and that that becomes a differentiator. Oh, if you go to Penn State, all of our classes are engaged and we all use technology and such. But if you go to, I don't know, I'll pick Pitt, uh, you don't have that same experience. And I'm, I'm curious, if you don't mind, I, I, I know we've got a number of faculty in here as well. I'd like to draw on them as well. But uh, Melanie, if you wouldn't mind. So what I'm asking about is that student experience. Has that yet become a differentiator in, our, in, the, in the criteria point for students? You know, I, um, it's, a, it's a good question because I don't even know if many higher education institutions have marketed it to the point at which students would be able to tell the, yes, right. the difference. So I, you know, the researcher may is thinking, could you set up some kind of A-B test <laughs> and whatnot. But at this point, I would say I don't know that I've even seen, with the exception of schools, who have fully online, for fully online programs, I have occasionally seen kind of trial courses, for example. Uh, but the trial courses are often less about whether the student is attracted to the technology as whether a student has the technological capabilities uh, and facilities to take a course online or how they can incorporate into their busy schedules. Um, a lot of trial courses often are around things like how uh, students concern that an online, a fully online course won't give this, them the same kind of student community or faculty interaction than they might in a ground course. 
So what I've seen mainly has been in the online space using that try before you buy forum, but it's more related to students' concerns about can they do the work and will they have enough student interaction. Capability, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, Chris? So this might be very shocking to everybody in this room, but higher educational institutions tend to not really uh, adapt to changes and, and trends in, in society very quickly. Um, and you mentioned some information about particular behaviors associated with millennials. And I'm wondering if you find that the institutions that respond to, to changes and, and, and adapt um, tend to do better in, in, in attracting and retaining those students, and if you have particular strategies that you like to, to talk to institutions about in terms of being more adaptable and being more nimble in terms of, of uh, responding to, to trends. Yeah, I think from a student retention perspective, certainly institutions who have are constantly thinking about how can we help students succeed um, are seeing results there. And I would say that they are really attacking the problem from all different areas. And that's probably been a differentiator for some schools in the last few years. If you look at the national conversation about student success maybe five or six years ago, it was pretty focused on the quick wins which were often first to second year retention and looking for students, looking at students who were in the categories most at risk, uh, maybe looking at demographics or high school GPA or, or whatnot. Many institutions really doubled down on those areas only to find that they pushed the problem back later. The first to second year retention improved, but then second to third year was where they saw a drop off. Uh, maybe they improved retention when it came to students most at risk, but actually they ignored what we think of as the murky middle. And uh, I would say that the institutions who have made the most gains in student success have realized how many different factors go into whether a student persists and graduates or not. There are, I showed the slide earlier related to first generation, but this would apply to pretty much any student. There are academic factors and financial factors and social, and we need to attack it from all different angles. We need to think about advising and what happens inside the classroom and whether there are career services so a student feels that it's worth it to finish. Um, and in just that sense that we can't just think about the problem in one way anymore. Herbert? Hi, I'm Herbert, uh, Creative Director here in Outreach and Online Education. Um, thank you for a very broad range of very interesting data. So I'm thinking back to the slides that you showed us uh, what has changed in the last five years. And I'm interested to look forward a little bit. So in your mind and using all this data that you have in your head, how would a university that is successful look like in five years or in ten years, if any change at all? Oh gosh. <laughs> you know, it's a, um, it's a big question and I would say that every institution probably over the next five years is going to need to think about uh, where it's going to place its bets, um, where it's going to focus its strategy. So on the one hand, I can say there are probably things that every single institution will do. Uh, every institution is doubling down more on career services and not as a separate thing, but as something that is deeply integrated into the curriculum so that academic outcomes and co-curricular outcomes are interrelated. That movement is just beginning, but I think that we will see it become more widespread so that it's not just something that happens in a few side offices on campus, that your most uh, go-getter students are taking advantage of, but something that is integrated into every single student from the moment they arrive, actually probably before that, from the moment they matriculate. Um, they are starting to think through intentionally over their four years not that we won't allow them to explore, I think that's a critical part of college, but they are also thinking about what internships, what extracurricular activities, how does that connect with what they're doing in the classroom. Um, I think we will absolutely see that. 
I think every single institution that we speak with is thinking about grand challenges. So how do we do a better job getting past disciplinary silos? Uh, every single institution that we are speaking with is talking about entrepreneurship. And recapturing that sense of uh, higher education in the past was unquestionably thought of as both a private and a public good. And more and more recent years, that notion of public good has really been at, at risk. There's so much more focus now on, on higher education just as a private good. Where I see higher education trying to recapture that public good notion is largely, and I don't think this should or has to be the only way, but there's been a lot of focus on entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so those are probably the broad trends across the board. For individual institutions, I think in each of those areas, they'll also have to focus. So how many grand challenges can you pursue as an institution? What do you want to be known for? Where are your strengths? Um, when it comes to experiential education, there's kind of a baseline everybody will need to do to compete. You have to have an internship office and probably have to have some service learning. How many institutions are going to go very bold when it comes to co-ops and capstones in the way, say, Northeastern has? Uh, and then when it comes to pedagogy, I, I think that institutions will need to think more about student success in the classroom rather than in terms of support infrastructure. So far, much of the focus on student success has been on things like advising and early alert systems and financial aid. There has been a little bit less focus, I would say, on, OK, what do we need to do differently inside the classroom? That is starting to change, but it probably will even more so, that's the next place to go over the next few years. Allow me a follow-up question. <clears throat> so that's very interesting, of course. Uh, will your university of the future still have credits, courses, programs, and degrees? You know, I... Um... There is a lot of rage now about, um, a lot of excitement now about competency-based education, which is uh, essentially the idea that credit should be given for mastery of knowledge rather than how long somebody spends in seed. And on the one hand, I find that a very attractive concept. Um, on the other hand, it's a very difficult concept in execution. Uh, first of all, it can be much harder in terms of student success for students not to have clear pacing schedules that they're trying to aim for. Um, second, in terms of mastery of knowledge, there can be some challenges to, well, how many times should a student be allowed to take a test? If it takes them 20 tries, did they master it the same way the student did who took one try or five tries? So while I, um, and, and I, I taught before I had my current role, and I, as a teacher, I'm sort of pedagogically fascinated by the idea of competency-based instruction and um, all of the potential pedagogical benefits. Thinking, though, about the student's ability to succeed and how the university would structure that experience, it gets complicated very fast. So what I think I would say I hope to see is um, I don't know if the model will be radically changed to us becoming, say, iTunes University, right? I, I think a lot of that takes into, does not take into account the value of the bundled experience, that something about how we put programs together so that knowledge can build and grow, and how programs can often be connected to experiences outside. Um, if you look at the music industry, for example, and the unbundling there into now you can buy a song for $1.99 on iTunes instead of bundling the albums, what you actually see is a rebundling. So maybe on iTunes you buy a song, song by song. But there are all of these other streaming services right now. My favorite one is Songza, which was acquired by Google Play, where they've rebundled all of the songs. So now maybe you're not buying an album by one musician, but you're listening to a stream called going to the farmer's market, or uh, editing Excel spreadsheets, because there's just value in bundling things together. Uh, so I would say when it comes to some of the more radical perceptions of a, a completely unbundled 
type of higher education, I think that will come with a lot of disadvantages, and we probably should more figure out what we can learn from those models than go at them whole cloth. Hello, Melanie Hello. Rose Cameron, Innovation. Could you page to the University of Montana screen for a moment? Because you brought something up in here that concerns me, which is on the left-hand side and, and these global leadership initiatives. Everyone in this room can look at that and recognize it as not the University of Montana, but actually as the five themes of excellence of Penn State. And we'll find that the University of the State of Washington has the five identical themes mm -hmm. as well, um, which are the generic challenges that the world is experiencing yep. versus specific ones that maybe universities have an expertise on. Um, are you seeing any shifts? Is this at the very beginning of that process, or are you starting to see uh, shifts occurring right now in the education uh, industry, as it were, to start fine-tuning these? Who do you think is doing the best job of truly doing leadership work versus what may just be problem, quite frankly? It's interesting because a lot of that is probably going to, um, what, what you're talking about I've seen probably more happen bottoms up than tops down. And I, I, one asp uh, school I think about in terms of having an interesting aspiration here is Michigan State University. And um, I, I think that they have a, a bold president who's talked a lot about the role of a land-grant institution in the world. And an in initiative I love there is called My Horse University. And My Horse University's goal is to be, there isn't of any other My Horse University out there, and their goal is to be the place that you come for if you are interested in equine research at whatever level at which you happen to be at. So you could be a hobbyist who just loves your horse. You could be a professional in the equine industry, or you could be a scholar. And their goal is to have essentially a place, My Horse University, where there is something for you, no matter who you are. And to really build that kind of community and that thought leadership and that brand that will also hopefully generate revenues in different ways. You could have students who are enrolling then in their courses. Uh, but you could also have this idea of um, findability. When it comes to research funders, those who are looking to give grants, a lot of what they're doing now is searching the way any of us search. Right? They're going to the internet, they're trying to find, well, who seems to be prominent in a certain area? And how do you develop that presence and that thought leadership in a, in a particular, uh, more clear subfield? Because you're right, I think these are the major challenges of society, so it would be hard for any institution not to tackle them. But how do you do that in a way that is connected to a center of excellence that you have that other institutions don't have to that extent. Or even what you see on the right side of the slide with UCLA's Sustainable LA Grand Challenge, maybe there's something that's a local challenge that your institution can help. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Ann Clements. I'm faculty. And you are obviously a teacher. That was such a beautiful presentation, so easy and clear to follow. I just loved it. I loved your use of statistics, and I've learned so much. Thank you. Um, can we go to slide nine? Because that was the competition, competition, competition. You could say it 10 more times. In my area, um, I'm, this left side of the slide is so fascinating to me. In my area, this is where we are. We have been the big research institution at the master's level. We were the kingdom of the domain for generations of students until the liberal arts colleges started to get in the market of we'll add a master's program. And I'll tell you, some of those programs are fantastic because the faculty are so eager to work with graduate students and make that investment. Um, but then what do we do if we are kind of getting out marketed in one of our own markets but then the, the challenge is the 
um, vetting that we need to um, go through in order to create that innovative, competitive program that is different than that traditional program that sprouted at a liberal arts college is so severe on a big campus like this, it's hard to get the buy-in. It's hard to have the market data saying that this innovative idea will be successful. And I guess I'm just kind of curious. I don't think that Penn State is alone in this issue, but how do we resolve competing in an environment where we have to be new, but we have that pressure of, of really being vetted to create the innovative program. I, I think some of that, um, every program is a little bit different, obviously. And I think some of it is figuring out for each program where you are related to, we need to think about a different strategy for the product versus we need to think about execution. One of my favorite business books is Blue Ocean Strategy, and, and the name comes from this idea that most organizations are competing in crowded areas where the ocean, this is a vivid metaphor, has gotten bloody with all the fish, I guess, killing one another. I'm not quite sure how that happened. but comes from shark tanks, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's the red ocean, and then there's the blue ocean, which are the uncontested waters. And what's interesting is that the authors of Blue Ocean Strategy actually, uh, several years later, wrote a book called Blue Ocean Execution. Um, and it started to focus more on that. So I think with any given program, say there's always trying to figure out a balance of what's your strategy versus execution uh, need? How would you pie chart out the time and resources you need to spend now? And then, well, OK, maybe what will it be three years from now so you're getting ahead of that? So with a lot of programs who are competing right now in terms of essentially having maybe commodified type products, um, and I think our experience, and Katie can speak to this as well, is that many of them have a long way to go before they actually have better marketing strategies. So there's a ton that we think institutions can do in order to differentiate their programs, not necessarily by changing the curriculum. If you think your curriculum is great and exactly what students need, um, don't try to go even more niche. Just help make sure that students are aware of your program, why it's great. And maybe there are ways to differentiate not just based on the curriculum, but based on the surrounding services. Uh, are there things that you can provide in terms of alumni networking and career outcomes and community? So I would say that's probably um, one main area. And then in terms of the differentiated strategy, uh, of course, some of that is, I think this is something Penn State has, has always been strong at historically. Um, but this is where we'll see schools looking at how do we do more corporate partnerships or association partnerships or something where you have the vetting and approval of a industry organization that's probably also helping you evolve your curriculum. Um, you know, in some ways, we love the idea of industry partnerships because they're both a great marketing strategy, but in terms of making sure that your program is always relevant, they help you there as well and help you stay cutting edge. Terrific. Thank you. Great responses. Let me just uh, scan the room here and see if there's any other outstanding questions, any comments. Well. Hearing none, please join me first in saying thank you to Melanie for a very thought-provoking and well-informed, well-researched project.